Okay, so I'm going to talk about Prometheus 2.0, uh, which is basically everything we have collected over one year that we wanted to break and make better. So part of that was a new storage engine, and that's actually our third generation. Um, the first one did not really work. Uh, the second one worked pretty well for a pretty long time. Um, but it turns out that infrastructure is getting more dynamic, and that's not always easy, um, and also puts a lot more stress and strain uh, on your monitoring system in the end. So we sort of started writing a new one. And to start with the basics, who has seen a time series before? Cool. So that's basically, a time series is just a sequence of uh, values that are associated with a certain timestamp. And then you can sort of like nicely plot them over a graph that has the time in the horizontal dimension. And that's what Prometheus does, right? It collects monitoring data from different targets and just um, sort of chains these samples uh, up in a sequence. But of course, it's not just a single time series, but there are quite a few ones. So typically, um, per target, you're monitoring a few hundred to thousands, and you can potentially up uh, monitor with a single Prometheus server a couple of hundred of targets. Um, then you have this huge pool, uh, which um, has basically time series with time in the horizontal dimension and the uh, series space sort of expanding in the vertical dimension. So that's sort of our plane along which we are reasoning about what we want to do with our storage. Um, and of course, now you have all these series, and you must be able to address them somehow and sort of infer what they semantically mean, right? It's otherwise, it's just like numbers and timestamps. Um, and we do that in Prometheus by metric names. And metric names are st stuff like request total. That's the semantic meaning. What does this time series represent? And then we partition these time series or these metrics along certain label dimensions. For example, uh, the request pass that was actually hit by request. Uh, which method was used and which status was returned and ultimately things like uh, which instance of my microservice um, is this metric about. And um, all these um, dimensions basically exponentially grow your, metric, your time series space, right? Um, you basically multiply your metrics by uh, a label and all the possible values for that label and then you have a second label and just grows and grows and grows. So there are a lot of time series potentially. Uh, and now you want to be, able to be able to select them. And you can do so by just specifying a metric name, um, which in this case here selects everything. But you can also then constrain it by certain label dimensions. So here we just select the first and the third time series, um, because the method label is obviously different in the second one. Uh, and you can basically combine these label dimensions and these selectors uh, arbitrarily. and can also use stuff like regexes. And that sort of captures our querying model, right? So we select time series by label dimensions, and that's completely arbitrary. And then we constrain this further by time dimensions. Right? We want to query, like um, in this case here, the last 10 minutes of data. But we also want to query a single series over the entire time, uh, or basically any rectangle in our two-dimensional space. And that's pretty tricky, because now we have to sort of cater to all these cases equally, because they are completely valid. Um, and to give sort of an order of scale what we are trying to do, um, so imagine you have 5 million active time series. That's not too unrealistic. That can, can reach that pretty quickly. Um, that if you have like 1,000 series per microservice or something, that it creates about like 3,000 to 15,000 uh, microservice instances that you're monitoring. And if you scrap these every 30 seconds for the newest sample and store this data for like one month, you end up um, with 432 billion samples in total. Um, and that's 160,000 uh, samples per second. Uh, and if you consider an 8-byte timestamp and an 8-byte value, that's 7 terabytes of data. That's um, pretty much uh, <laughs> pretty much too much for a single node. Um, at least you don't want like, Prometheus to be like this huge beast which needs like a terabyte of disk. Um, and because of that, we need to sort of like, compress this data down in some way, right? And um, as you can sort of imagine, for timestamps, there's some repetition in there. So if I scrape every 30 seconds, well, uh, there's obviously like pretty much always a 30 second uh, or delta of 30 between the timestamps I'm collecting. So if I look at that, um, this is always like 30, uh, except for one case, that's 29. Um, but pretty much if I just take the delta between timestamps for a series, um, I can reduce this down pretty, pretty uh, massively, right? So this is just like the textual representation, but you can also obviously now store these deltas in fewer bytes or bits. Um, and actually, you can do even better. So if you consider now that these deltas are pretty much always the same, you can just consider after the second one, well, the next delta is probably going to be the same as a current delta. So if I take the delta of the delta, well, you get even smaller numbers, which is better because you can compress these better. 
Um, and that's sort of how timestamp compression works. Uh, and now we have to compress values. And uh, historically in Prometheus, we used uh, this pretty similar compression for uh, values as well, because most values are actually integers, like counters. Um, and for floating point values, we just had to sort of bite the bullet and um, store the full uh, value. Uh, but as most things are actually timestamps, uh, actually integers, um, that still like gave us a compression of about like 4.4 bytes to f for each 16 byte sample. But um, then Facebook came along uh, about like two years ago, and they published a paper on how they are doing time series, and their compression was particularly interesting. And I think what they're doing is sort of adopted now by pretty much every TSDB out there. Um, at least Influx uses the same scheme. Um, and it works by looking at the bit representation of uh, floating point values. And if you look at, for example, decimal numbers, you see that there are a lot of trailing zeros. And that sort of shows there's certainly some redundancy that can be optimized away in some way. Um, and now we could, of course, just say, okay, just store how many trailing zeros there are in a value instead of storing all the zeros. Um, that's a good first step, but actually, if you now consider that values do not change all that much, right? Many values are constant for hours and hours, um, but even if they change, they often like, change not all that much. For example, a counter probably always goes up in a pretty steady space. Um, therefore, the representations of the floating point values are also pretty much the same if you look at the bits. And if we XOR these, so if we XOR every value with a previous value, we get even more zeros because these bits didn't change. Um, and then we can actually store the trailing and the leading zeros of a value um, and thereby just have to consider this like tiny uh, slice in the middle where the values actually change. And naturally, if we um, have values that are constant, which is actually like 60% of values in monotonic systems, um, that just x also zero, like completely, and we can just store this as a single bit. And the same is true for timestamp, right? Um, if a timestamp is exactly this, if the timestamp is exactly the expected double delta, like zero in this case, you can just store a zero. So, and this also works with actual floating point values, which was not the case for our double delta encoding. Um, so even floating point values with some like fractions um, compress pretty well, even though not quite as well as the uh, actual decimal numbers. But in total, this brings us down from um, 16 bytes per sample to 1.37 bytes per sample. Um, and that's obviously pretty good, right? Because now our seven terabytes go down to well, less. <laughs> uh, notably less, right? So you can probably fit in like 600 to 700 gigabytes, uh, which is certainly more realistic. So um, actually this compression scheme was used by Prometheus, or is used by Prometheus 1 in the same way, mostly. Um, actually with some twists to it, but that's pretty much how, we, how we're doing it and how we're achieving this really good on disk size. Um, what we then do, um, if we compress these samples in this way, um, we only have streaming access, so we can only like look forward. We cannot go back, and we cannot jump randomly somewhere um, and look what the value was. Actually, we might be able to go back, but that's not necessary. Um, so to sort of work around this, you just chunk up your data. So every like 200, 500 samples, you just make a clean cut and start a new chunk, and then you can sort of jump between the beginnings of the chunks and to access series in the middle in a time range that is sort of relevant to your query. And Prometheus one. Uh, now just takes all these chunks for a certain series and just writes a file per series and then just has a sequence of these one kilobyte large chunks. Um, that works great for up to five minutes years probably. That's probably still okay. Um, there's a lot of files, but like you have a file system, right? And file sy systems are kind of sort of designed to handle files. So that's a pretty good match. Um, the problem is series churn. Um, and series churn is something that we see as these environments you're monitoring get more and more dynamic um, because things you're monitoring are not staying around. They go um, at a random point in time and come back. Uh, for example, if you do like a rolling update or do auto scaling, right, you create applications, you destroy them again, and every process that comes up is sort of its own new target with its own identity and therefore also has its own series that come along with it. So we see here like series start and, um, and stop in sort of arbitrarily long and uh, short intervals, and that's somehow what we have to handle now. And while we might have only five minute active time to at a time that we are collecting data from, in total over like our one month of retention, that might be 150 million. And that's 
often too much for file systems, um, even to the point where you might run out of inodes, and then you're pretty much uh, screwed because you can, the only thing you can do is like reformat your file system uh, and start from scratch, and that's obviously uh, not a good thing for a tool that's supposed to be super available and reliable. And actually, this then ends up like this, right? All these tiny series, um, but your query pattern pretty much stays the same. Um, the problem now is that we might still do these rectangular queries, and actually a lot of the space here we are sort of querying over is empty. Like most series do not have data in the time windows we query. So now our index still has to contain all these series to look them up, um, but actually must be way more selective about what it returns. Um, so the index also um, sort of started showing issues in Prometheus uh, 1. So sort of going straight to the solution, um, what we do in the new Prometheus storage is we divide our entire series space into sort of vertical blocks um, where we just shard our data by time. And each of these blocks here acts as its own database. So it has its own set of chunks for series. Um, it has its own index for all these series. Um, and if we want to query data, we just sort of go to all these blocks individually and get a partial result and then merge us back into one of our results that's then shown to the user. And as we can see here, uh, kind of obvious um, that we'd only have to touch blocks that are actually relevant to our queries. So for the first query, for example, we just have to, or the far right query, we just have to look at the most recent block, um, which has a smaller index, which has less data to look up in total, um, and sort of be pretty naturally uh, are able to sort of scale a bit better. Um, and what we do then is that all blocks that are sort of out of our time range where we expect new data are just written down to disk. And after that, they are immutable. So we never touch them again, except for querying. And the two most recent blocks, these are the blocks that we keep in memory completely. And that's where we write new data. And as soon as we start the next block, because the time range for the most recent block is over, uh, we write this down to disk. Um, but obviously, there's like a cost if we look at that, right? Uh, um, the biggest box here has to touch um, five blocks. And that's sort of still pretty much OK. But now imagine you have, I don't know, like a year of data. And now you have 250 blocks that you have to touch for a single query. That might still be fine. But now you have to merge 250 partial results back together. And that certainly comes with a merging cost that you might not be willing to pay or wait for. So old data, or data that's immutable, um, can be compacted. So we take our five blocks that are sort of the initial size and compact them down into two larger blocks, which has a benefit now that we have to touch fewer, fewer blocks if we want to query data, um, and we can merge it uh, for a lower cost. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the design. <laughs> um, but this sort of also enables a lot of other things. For example, um, retention. At some point, you have to delete data. And in the file-based design that Prometheus 1 has, you have to sort of go through all files and look periodically, OK, do we have data that can be spawned away? If not, move on. If yes, take the file, delete all the data, and write a new file, but leave out the data that's sort of supposed to be deleted, um, which not only is pretty CPU in intensive, it also, um, of course, causes a lot of uh, disk I.O., which is not really good, especially if you're like in AWS and use cloud volumes, um, which have limited IOPS. Uh, in the Prometheus case, let's say the red line here sort of symbolizes our retention boundary and everything before we don't really care about anymore. Um, well, just delete the directory that contains this block and you're done. It's like a free operation. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, one huge benefit. Then indexing. So these magic blocks here have some magic index. Um, so how does this work? Um, it is not like the index in Prometheus 1, uh, simply because even though we are ab able to reduce the total like, time range we are, we are querying, um, the sort of algorithmic complexity doesn't change. So in the worst case, we are compacting these blocks into larger blocks up to, up to like one month. And then we still have this huge problem that our index doesn't scale with the amount of data that we accumulated over a, sing uh, over a whole month. So therefore, we also need a new index. And that's where we just go and steal from Google, uh, pretty much. I know this is sort of just um, the same approach that you use for full text search engines. So if you have a document, you want to sort of search for words, 
you don't go, go to every single document and look like, do we have this word, do we have this word, do we have this word. Um, instead, when you sort of index the document, you look at every word, and you take the doc document ID and put it in a list for this particular word that this word now occurs in this document. So if you want to search whether for all documents containing a word, you just reverse this list that you have stored for this word, uh, and you get all the document IDs, which is a lot cheaper and faster, obviously. And we can sort of apply the same pattern here. So if we consider that every label in a time series is a word, like the full thing, like uh, job equals nginx is one word, uh, then you have six words here, including the metric name. And we can now just um, index this time series by uh, giving, giving an ID, which is sort of unique and uh, increasing within its block. And then we just append the ID to all these lists, all these ID lists for these words here. Um, which we see sort of as an example there, there for status and method. Uh, and then a good thing about this is uh, we can do super efficient K-way set operations. So intersections, merges, uh, or sort of other deltas. So for example, here we have, um, yeah, we have a few, we see that we have a few like matching IDs here in these two lists. That's two, five, and 1502. And the rest is sort of irrelevant. And the method equals get list goes on into infinity. Um, so ideally, we'd be able to, but we see that um, method get uh, has the last value of almost a million, whereas the last value in the status list is 500,000. So ideally, we do not traverse the whole method equals get list just sort of uh, the, uh, just to the point where we have our result set. And if we have these uh, list of sorted IDs, uh, we can just traverse them by, by putting cursors at the front of each list. And then I've got the values. We just compare these values. And OK, two is more than one. So we just sort of move the cursor for status 200 forward. And then we see a match. And we put this into our result set. And then we move both cursors forward. And then we see three and five. So we can advance the second list to at least five, because all the other values cannot be matched, because the next value is five in the upper list. Um, so we get another match, five. And we move both, both cursors on again. Um, and then we move, move forward the um, list with the lower value again to 1502, so the next, to the next value that's greater or equals 99. And then we sort of proceed with this pattern, and at some point we say, okay, 1502, 1502, that's our last element, and then we advance both cursors again, and we see that our first list has come to an end, and the second list is way beyond that already, so we can just terminate at this point. So regardless of how long the second list would be, um, we sort of scale along with our result set. And um, this makes um, set operations uh, really efficient and also works with uh, more than uh, two lists, obviously. And that's sort of how the new index uh, works. And this index is placed in every single block. And then, um, yeah, the results are merged back together across these blocks. So, uh, benchmarks. Um, maybe I can show actually one. So um, during development, I sort of wrote this small tool which does sort of pure benchmarking of the TSDB library without any sort of noise from actually collecting data from, uh, from different targets of the network. Um, and it's literally just out of process throwing data at this time series database. Um, and it used to be a lot better. Um, but yeah, we added features and got slower. Um, but let's see how that should turn out. So, um, this now sort of just throws a bunch of samples for 100,000 time series at this TSDB. And it takes a while. Um, and it's just sort of generating most or more or less random data that sort of um, resembles what, what you usually see in time series. And we see that it's sort of compacting new blocks. So it's accumulating blocks in memory. And um, then it's finishing one, compacts it to disk, and writes the next one. And at some point, it has enough blocks uh, accumulated that are compacted to sort of recompact them into larger blocks. So it's taken the previous three blocks and writing a new larger block out of it. Uh, and now it's done. So it took like 30 seconds, and it appended like 300 million samples. Um, yeah, at, and at a speed of like 10 million samples per second. And that's sort of on a MacBook, which was like Slack running and everything. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, more or less this kind of, it was at like up to like 17, I think at some point, but that's certainly like way beyond the point that we need. Um, and at this point we could be pretty sure that the actual 
sort of performance uh, will be lost in other places. So we just sort of moved on into like actually proper benchmarking. And for that, actually, we set up for the first time ever an actual benchmarking suite for Prometheus, so, um, which was um, sort of trying to simulate the environment that actually caused these problems, which motivated us to do this whole thing, um, which are Kubernetes clusters, which make it like really easy to redeploy constantly and start and stop pods at any point in time. Um, so this benchmark setup spins up a Kubernetes cluster in AWS. You can sort of pick your node sizes, etc. And a few dedicated nodes for Prometheus, so like that would be a, have at least reasonably good isolation uh, for performance measurements. And then we deploy this fake microservice, which exposes some metrics, um, and we deploy like Ethernet instances of that, and all the Kubernetes components, and we are monitoring all these. That puts us at about um, 120,000 samples a second, um, with like 300,000 active time series. That's not extreme by any means, but that's sort of a pretty advanced setup. Like most people won't have that. Um, and to simulate this serious churn, we swap out F, like 50% of all our applications every 10 minutes. And that's, like, that's very straining. That's certainly at a much faster pace than any production environment. Um, but this sort of just to ensure that we are on the right track and the next, not only the next two years, but also the next like five to 10 years uh, are properly covered by this database. So that was boring. And uh, now the graphs, which are nice and shiny. Um, so they are not particularly labeled well, but um, what we are basically doing is we're running four Prometheus servers, um, uh, two times 1.5, um, and one is being queried and one is not being queried. So just to have the comparison, how much querying actually impacts uh, the performance. And the same below for the Prometheus 2.0 branch. And as you can kind of see, um, for the unqueried Prometheus 1.5, um, the CPU goes up to like, I don't know, eight cores or something um, with pretty heavy spikes in between. And then it goes up pretty rapidly, uh, about half into it. Uh, and that is where we actually start deleting all data. And as I said before, that's pretty expensive because it cycle through all these different files and rewrite them constantly. Uh, so yeah, basically it might, might possible that Prometheus runs good for quite a while until it, it starts deleting data and then um, it might not really be a good fit for it, the node anymore. Uh, and querying sort of shows the same pattern roughly. Um, yeah. Uh, in comparison, Prometheus 2.0, um, it's sort of sitting at half a core-ish uh, for the same amount of samples uh, and about like twice the size for when it's being queried, um, which sort of shows that the next thing to optimize is probably querying. Um, but yeah, that's like a savings of hmm, 20. Huh? Uh, that's, oh, <laughs> but it looks the same as well. Huh? <laughs> okay, so uh, everything I said. <laughs> so qu querying is even worse. Like, okay, so it's not 20, but I was confused. Um, no, it's like five to seven uh, X memory savings. That's still pretty good. Um, and actually, th there's, if that's not all coming from the storage itself. Uh, it's also because the new storage enabled us play some sort of like neat trick, um, which is you now placed wrong, but um, sort of when we're ingesting data, just sort of, um, so um, it's a bit complex, not really. Um, so if you ingest data, we get this string of a metric descriptor, right, which is sort of describing the time series and then the value and then the timestamp, and, and you have to pass that. Um, what now happens is that we pass a metric, so we have to instantiate the actual metric object, and we get a timestamp and a value, uh, which means allocations. And then, because these labels might come up in like a random order, uh, we have to sort the metric to have like a stable identity further below. And then we add this, or try to throw this at the storage. And the storage checks the timestamp. Okay, this timestamp goes into this block. Um, now I have to find in this block somehow the series in memory that actually the sample has to be appended to. So how do I find this? Well, probably best to hash this metric. Uh, so we take the hash, which is also expensive, um, because we have to now take a hash of our multiple strings for every sort of label name and label value. And then we ask the block uh, what series uh, belongs to this hash. And then we have to do a collision detection. So now we have to actually compare the label, we f label set we found via the hash with the label, label set we put in, and have to compare all these strings. So pretty expensive. Um, but once we've found it, we can just append it to the series, and we can move on. <coughs> 
Uh, yeah, just a, quite a few expensive things happening here, right? Um, allocating a metric, parsing it, sorting it, hashing it, uh, doing collision detection before we actually get to the point where we just, I don't know, append a tuple to an array. <laughs> so um, what to do now is that we have a sort of stable ID within a block for our time series. Um, and by the end, we take this reference that we have for this series in this block and we turn it to our sort of ingestion layer that's collecting data. And then we add a new method, add fast, which is faster. Um, and now if um, Prometheus scrapes a target and sees a certain string representation, um, it can look into its cache of these references uh, and can look up if, I, if this string it now just saw um, ever sort of was passed already and whether we appended the sample successfully and got a reference back. And if so, um, we just call it fast versus reference instead of the past metric. Um, and we just have to get the block for this time and get the series by D, which is a lot faster um, because it just like, it's an offset into an array. And then we append to the series. So thereby saving all the parsing, all the allocations, uh, saving the sorting, um, the hashing and the hash lookup, the collision detection, um, this all goes away. And actually, um, these references might be rejected at some point when a block sort of goes out of, out of, out of date. Um, but on average, this sort of can be called every time. So one out of like 100 or 150 um, appends actually has to call at. All the other ones call at fast, thereby skipping all this CPU intensive stuff. And that's uh, mainly the cause by CPU usage is not well, like two or three cores, but at like half a core. So memory, um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, memory savings are actually a lot better than CPU savings. Uh, that was one of the main goals actually, right? Um, because Prometheus tends to be not necessarily memory hungry, but unpredictable in terms of memory consumption. And this is sort of fixed, right? We reach a steady state and do not ramp up over like hours and hours um, until we reach at, like end up at some, some state that we cannot really determine. Um, yeah. And actually we use this, these savings to implement features that now eat more memory, um, but we are still like a lot lower. So um, disk writes, that was surprising because we never bothered measuring disk writes before, ever. Um, yeah, and they were pretty bad. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's megabytes written per second. Um, almost reaching like 100, especially like after retention kicks in. Um, yeah, not so good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the new Prometheus, it's like sort of hoovering out like one megabyte. That's when it's writing data into a writer headlock. And when these compactions happen and you write like larger blocks of persistent data, we have these small spikes, which are still pretty reasonable at like four megabytes a second for a few seconds. So great saving there, like 98%. Um, and then on this size, even more surprising, um, but that's actually, we're using the same compression and actually samples are most of our data. So th there should have been sort of on par, right? Um, turns out this really highly induced um, churn of series by scaling all these pods every 10 minutes up and down. Um, they were just collect, uh, creating so many new series um, and all this overhead that is constant per series is just quite a bit bigger in Prometheus 1. Uh, and so we ended up with like, I don't know, 4x less storage requirements. But like, practically that's not gonna be what, we, what you see in production, right? Maybe gonna save a bit, um, but certainly not all that much. What's the y-axis? Huh? Oh, that's, that's the gigabytes of, this, of the storage on disk. Yeah, but we can sort of see like six hours of data at 120,000 samples a second ends up being like seven gigabytes. So, so the ratio of hmm? the, 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 the y-axis is the ratio of No, that's, that's uh, gigabytes on disk, on disk size. Uh, that's disk writes per second. Uh, yeah, and querying. So two of these Prometheus servers are being queried um, and we wrote this sort of uh, not super advanced tool, but it sort of fires common queries against uh, these metrics they're collecting from these fake microservices. Um, so it's pretty good like mix of short queries and long queries and uh, heavy aggregations and just like queries over uh, for, for a few series over long ranges of time. Um, Uh, yeah, so we, yeah, as we see in, in 2.0, that's the storage sort of like climbing up steadily. That's when the wider headlock fills. And that is obviously larger on disk than um, 
then a compacted and compressed block. Uh, so whenever compaction happens, we delete it by the head lock, and then this goes down again a bit. That's a good question. Uh, we haven't found out yet. We just know that. <laughs> <laughs> and now, honestly, I think it's like something office reporting, to be honest, um, because practically we haven't found any anomalies yet in the data. So, um, yeah, I've, I have no idea, to be honest. Which one's the prior one? That also I don't remember, to be honest. These are like screenshots from some time ago, so. Um, Uh, retention time? I mean, for how long do you keep your data? Uh, in this case, retention is set as, at six hours. So we can sort of see that at six hours, if retention actually starts, there are, there are spikes in memory and CPU. Have you have tests for like, longer retention periods? Uh, we have, yeah. yeah. So long we have pretty much the same, just spread over a longer interval. Yeah, so querying. Um, this is a 99th percentile latency for this wild mix of queries. Um, and we can see here that Prometheus 1.5 sort of linearly ramps up because series are added to the storage and all these series go to the same index. The index is not really optimized for this amount of series. Uh, so this goes up just until we start deleting all data and are deleting all series. Uh, then it sort of levels off, but it's like super spiky. It's pretty much unpredictable performance. Um, and Prometheus 2.0 in contrast sort of reaches a steady state right at the beginning just because the index is sort of more efficient. Um, and then just keeps this um, performance with a, yeah, just a few spikes up and down, probably when compaction is going on. Um, uh, that's a white mix. That's, that's what I said. Like, it's not, it's not like super granular. Um, it's just to show like the overall trend. Um, but the, the delta is approximately the same, whether you're accruing like recent data or old data or heavy aggregations. Um, it's, it's the same trend. Yeah, uh, that's sort of it. If that sounds somewhat interesting, um, there's a full write-up on my blog, which contains exactly this post and nothing else. Um, you can download it. Uh, there are like three alpha releases now. Uh, we're gonna do a better, hopefully soon. Um, code is here. Um, yeah, and the operator is pretty cool, actually, even though Tom tells you differently. Uh, <laughs> has, has anybody tried it? How was it? Uh, yeah, and PromCon, like Matt told you already, um, that's going to happen. Um, yeah, and that was all from my side. Thank you. <laughs>